Hi, and welcome back to the History Machine podcast. This is episode 13 on Early China. So I know there's been a long gap, but I have to say, and Carl, you can thoroughly agree with me, that hands down, this episode and the episodes that are going to follow it have had the most amount of research we have ever had to do, the most amount of extended trying to get things translated, the most amount of trying to work out actually what's going on, updates to the history machine and different changes just to get a firm grasp on what we're going to be talking about. So this episode is going to be on early China and we're going to have a follow up episode after it dealing with the Warring States period and then moving in to the Qin Empire. Yeah, we're finally getting out of our Eurocentric bubble. But the price of that is you've had to spend months doing research and in the meantime, I've just been entirely re revamping all the code for the history machine. Um, so both of us have been busy. There's been good reason, I think, for the gap. It's not going to be a one and done episode. This is going to be a multi-parter. So to begin with this, a lot of this actually starts with archaeology, just to explain China. So China as a place has been populated with people since the early days that humanity have migrated eastward. And it has never not had people since that point. So China is an area with a really, really broad climate. The north tends to be very cold. The south is really tropical. And it has obviously plains, mountains, forest, jungle. Um, the north of China tends to grow a lot of wheat and millet, and the south tends to grow a lot of rice. Early people who did settle in China settled inland near rivers, so they didn't really have an access to the ocean. And since they didn't have an access to the ocean, a lot of their early myths and their mythology usually involve deities who are either like river gods or forest gods. So for China as a whole, there's two main places, two main rivers where people have localized. There's the Yellow River and there's the Yangtze River. The Yellow River is essential to China's well-being. It very much is to China what the Nile is to Egypt. Now, the Yellow River, unlike the Nile, can be incredibly unpredictable. It has good years, it has bad years, it has floods, it has droughts. It can either save a lot of lives or it can kill a lot of people. So the earliest excavations around these areas find a lot of scrying bones, usually sheep bones, sometimes turtoise shells, cattle shoulder bones. And they almost always have some kind of like burnt on inscription with a message that's like, will it flood this year? Will we have a good harvest? Is there going to be a drought? But in Chinese mythology, there's a huge emphasis for their rulers on irrigation and on just making sure you can actually grow some food. Effective irrigation is very much the responsibility and the justification for having a strong, organized and central authority with states, officials and nobles. Their job is to communicate or provide some divination or just make sure that like this year we can grow crops. This year, you know, people don't get killed because of a flood. Make sure there's enough rain and whatever way they might have to communicate with the cosmos. That's their responsibility. And they need to make sure that they do that correctly to make sure that whatever society that's living here near the Yellow River, the Yangtze, is doing well and needs to live well in that way. One of the earliest cultures known there is the Yangshao culture, which is about 4000 BC, and that's a very small group of people. Almost everything that's known about them is just based on archaeology. So I'm going to skip all over them because we have almost no information just other than the obvious, the divination and some of the, the bones, the scrying, that kind of a thing, little messages. After that period, you have the Longshang period, which is about 3000 BC. And they notice that there's a little bit of a population increase. You'll find more scattered villages. They tend to appear. By about 2300 BC, you will have towns, settlements, and they will have rammed earth walls. So a rammed earth wall is one that's not made of stone. It's literally compact dirt and it's packaged together and it's stacked upward and it makes a, a clay or kind of earth wall. And from these towns and settlements, there is actually evidence of human sacrifice. Now, bodies are buried underneath walls. Bodies are found, you know, and it looks like that they're probably POWs that were killed. There is some kind of religious idea of human sacrifice. It's not unknown to other cultures. Like uh, it's heavily implied that the early Romans practiced human sacrifice as well. But it's just around that time, around 2300 BC, you'll find that some civilizations in China were practicing that. So around the year 2000 BC, rulers who studied and utilized astronomy or astrology, they're kind of interchangeable at this point. They lean towards an early concept, and this will show up time and time again when we talk about China, of the mandate of heaven. 
So rulers and priests are responsible for making accurate predictions. They need to read signs. They need to look at the cosmos and make some decisions. They need to practice divination, whether they're using the, the turtoise shells or they're throwing dice, whatever they might be doing, they're doing that to try and make these predictions. Similar to other early societies, that's kind of what they're doing. It's very important that the priesthood and the nobles are doing that. And the mandate of heaven is like, are we okay to rule? This is going to be a cool little fact, and it comes up a lot in the history, and it will come up when we're talking about various big battles and empires and episodes. But approximately every 516 years, we have something called a five-planet alignment, and that can be seen in the sky. Now, this has huge implications regarding the mandate of heaven, and it's going to show up constantly and consistently in Chinese history. I love a culture that is so old that a 516-year cycle is significant. Like it's, yeah, that's, that's too, that's longer than a lot of other cultures survived. I feel like it's just, it is insane. It's longer than the Persians lasted or the Achaemenid Persians. So yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty insane. So for example, in 1900 BC, the first dynasty, and I'm going to say dynasty in air quotes here, they appeared. Now they're known as the Jia dynasty. Now they're almost completely mythical. There's no written sources from them. There's very little information. Everything that's after them is secondhand and is literally written centuries after the fact. So the figure who comes out of this is you, the Great. He's an early figure and he's remembered. And this will harper back a little bit to what I just mentioned, but he's a great builder and he's a particularly a great builder of irrigation and irrigation structures, just to show the importance that we need to make sure that we utilize these rivers and we grow our crops effectively. So the Emperor of Jia was known as Emperor Qi, and he was the son of you, the Great. And archaeological evidence suggests that there was a small, very humble settlement around the Yellow River. And that's where this dynasty was from. So the Jia have five early grand mythical emperors. And emperor is a very loose title here in that sense of, of what we want to talk about. It, You know, it's when you think emperor, you often think grand, super palace, colossal empire stretches on beyond the horizon. These are definitely small, probably comparable to little kingdoms. But at the time, they're still kind of called emperors. China at this point of history is constructed of thousands of other small microstates. In 1550 BC, the Jia are conquered by the Shang. Now the Shang last another 500 or so years after they conquer the Jia and their capital, so the Shang's capital is Anyang, which is a small round earth city with evidence of human sacrifice again, probably POWs case, and oracle bones are still all the rage this time. The Shang are approximately contemporaries of the mythical Troy. So just if you want to put it like the timeline, when Agamemnon and Achilles are meant to be conquering the and sacking the city of Troy, the Shang are meant to be in China here, practicing human sacrifice and, you know, living, living in Anyang. Mm -hmm. Essentially, when we think of something really old, we think of usually the classics. Mm -hmm. And this is the time period they thought was far away enough, like long ago enough that like, yeah, we can make up stories about now as the big mythical thing. Yeah, pretty good. So I'm going to talk a tiny bit about the chariot. I know that it seems like, where's this coming from? But it's important to mention it because for a lot of early Chinese warfare, the chariot is going to be the top tier technology. We know that the horse was domesticated somewhere near the Ukrainian steppes around 10,000 years ago. But around the year 2000 BC, the Shang are the first people in China to use horses and then to use chariots. Chariots, as we know them, were built and pulled by various domesticated animals throughout time. Uh, I think it was first for donkeys, primarily horses were used, but later in history, even for like um, rituals, you'll have chariots being pulled by elephants. So an example we have of that is actually Pompey the Great had a chariot that was pulled by uh, an elephant, just to, you know, get the audacity of, wow, cool, elephant pulled chariot. But um, so they become a very ritualistic piece of equipment, but before they're ever ritualistic, they are used extensively for warfare. Now, the chariot is the cutting edge of technology when it is invented, and it spreads like wildfire. It's going to go as far west as Ireland, and you'll have chariots found as far east as Korea as well. So it, it, it just spreads. It goes completely west and completely east. It is the, you have to have a technology. Now, there are different styles and types of chariot, and different functional ones exist. It kind of goes, it doesn't necessarily go without saying, but earlier breeds of horses are smaller. They literally have less horsepower. So you need to utilize a chariot as the cavalry arm of the army. But the horse itself 
isn't strong enough really to carry the standard soldier that you wanted to carry. So usually you literally tie a few of them together, <laughs> attach a chariot to it, and then you can use it. And obviously when the horse is domesticated, not everyone is immediately overnight an expert, you know, horseback rider. Like that all has to be figured out over time. So before that's figured out, people have literally had to find a way to attach a mechanism to these animals. And then usually it's a two man job to operate the chariot. One person's going to have to, you know, get the horses to go in the direction they want to go. And the other person's probably going to have to be the warrior where they're shooting arrows or attacking. Chariots, when they are invented, having them determines if you're going to be a first class power or not. And they spread so quickly and they probably wipe out so many areas that don't have a cavalry arm of the army that it just becomes the you have to have it. I think it's really hard to underestimate, especially when you're dealing with, I think, basically anything up until mechanization or, you know, good ranged weapons. If you have a means to go faster than the other people where they can't, you can attack them and they can't run back and attack you in time because you're already gone. There's just no... It, people really couldn't figure out a good way to deal with that for an insanely long time. Mm. Like, and you see it time again, and even later on when you, you know, I suppose going a couple of thousand years yeah. in the future, like the Mongols being the ones to conquer China, that is again, they have horses and can ride them incredibly well and go faster than anyone else, and you just can't do anything against that. So chariot versus having horses, even if they're, you know, pulling chariots, even if it's not as fast as just a horse running relatively unencumbered, it's still a hell of a lot faster than anyone else has, and there's not much you can do yeah, against that. definitely. So with chariots, as you mentioned, you can have different kind of weapons. So missile weapons are very common, whether it's like, you know, the bow and arrow is fine. Perfect example. But people using chariots might also use like spears, pole arms, uh, in some cases, even just huge, you know, double headed axes. Like it, it think of a weapon that's been used on a chariot because you got that speed, you have the momentum, you have... Um, you have the kinetic energy and you have the literal force that it, that it brings behind it. Now, the problem with a chariot, because you're, you're kind of going, why doesn't the chariot last as long as it does? Or why don't we see it forever? A couple of things about it. It's very expensive to build one. It requires a lot of skilled manufacturers to make it. Uh, there is upkeep required for chariots because imagine the same as just like having a car or having any kind of vehicle. You're like, you need to oil it, you need to grease it, you need to whatever. You need to do that for a chariot, but they don't really have oil and grease for their axles. They're using animal fat. So you have to kill a substantial amount of animals just to make sure your chariot is still functioning and make sure that it can still work. And then it also requires relatively flat terrain. It's really terrain based. You know, you can have ter some terrain that's just not suitable for it. Like you can't just ride through a forest with a chariot. That's going to be a problem too. So why we're mentioning the chariots so much here, because you're like, okay, this is an episode about China. It's not an episode about chariots. China are going to use chariots long after they fall out of fashion in the Mediterranean. So that can be explained very quickly that the chariot becomes, it, it, it was the weapon of the nobles. It was the weapon of the upper class. It was the weapon of royalty. And then later in later Chinese armies, they're still using the chariot, but they're still using it now as this like mobile command platform on top of other functions. So in an, in an era where Julius Caesar will be going, you know, the Celts are really stupid here in Britain to be using chariots, China is still going to be using them anyway. And I'd say if, you know, if the Romans met the Chinese, they'd be like, these guys are really good, but I don't know why they're using this very old technology along with everything else they have. Like, for example, the Chinese are going to be operating crossbows on, ch on chariots. So you're like super advanced technology over super regular old technology. Um, so, uh, oh, another tiny little bullet point just to mention about the chariot, which is very cool, is the Rook in Chess is meant to represent a chariot. So that'll tell you just how important it was in the army. It's meant to be the strong, mobile piece that moves in one direction very quickly, and it is a form of cavalry on the chessboard. So if you think on the chessboard, you have the knight and you have the, the rook. The rook is able to go very far in one direction, and the knight is like a flexible, light cavalry unit. And just to complete the set, uh, the bishop is based on the elephant, and the, the pawn, the queen, and the king, they're all based on like the infantry. And that's the idea, just the chessboard. But... But if you think of yourself like the rook is one of the strongest parts in the game of chess. So if you imagine you go, that's just how important the chariot was in early ancient warfare. So back to the Shang. The Shang, they're incredibly dependent on tribute from surrounding states for their survival. So they're kind of like we're kind of bullying other small micro states into providing us with resources. We have to make sure that if they don't do that, you know, we, we kind of pressure them. So how most countries start. Basically. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. They kind of remind you a little bit of the Neo-Assyrians in that sense. Now, a little other note as well. The word Shang 
has an etymology contemporary kind of Chinese it tends to mean a trader or a merchant but its original etymology which is kind of cool just to, to note the idea of to see where they're coming from the word shang can be related to like ritual and temple so we're still harping on back to the idea that these nobles who are in charge of these societies they're still all about you know the religious aspect the astrology astronomy aspect and the amount of like still need to have the mandate of heaven and the prediction so in 1059 bc so this is 13 years after there was a five planet alignment the shang are determined to have lost the mandate of heaven now i want to talk a tiny bit about a five planet alignment just to kind of put that out there when you think of a five planet alignment it's like there are five planets in the sky that are meant to align together now they're not in one straight perfect line the coolest way to imagine it and the easiest way that this would have been visible at the time is if you get your hand you get your arm you outstretch it you open up your fingers as far as you can and you have your five fingers that's somewhere in that kind of region in the sky that you have your hand pointing up towards you will see five bright star-like structures which are planets and that's the idea that once every 516 odd years you have that kind of, of an alignment so for the various states just to give you an example in uh, 1953 bc there was a five planet alignment that that spelt the divine approval for the Jia. in 1576 bc there was another one for the decline of the Jia and the rise of the shang in 1059 bc there was another one for the decline of the shang and the rise of the zhao and then in 1046 bc the vassal state of zhao rose up and just to note for the various listeners, this is a cool one. We should expect another five planet alignment around 2040. Anyway, with this five planet alignment, which you know, spells a little bit of the, the doom, the Shang are overthrown. And during their last gasps, the king of Shang is meant to have gathered all of his valuables, including jade, jewels and concubines, and then gets himself, puts them all together, puts them in a big pile, sets fire to it and dies in a violent end. Um, so that's kind of the way he goes out. I take it the concubines didn't have a say. No, in I, re this I really don't think they did. <laughs> yeah. So in 1045 BC, Jupiter, this is, you know, through astronomical predictions, is clear in the sky. So there's meant to be a battle, the Battle of Muye. And King Wu of Zhao is meant to win this battle. I suppose what, what to expect from Chinese battles, especially of this era, which is insane army mm -hmm. sizes um that i think are actually just so large that they kind of throw the history machine off um and i think i, I do notice larger margins of error mm. in the history machine when running it for some of these yes. ones uh the recorded strength modern estimates are probably about one tenth of the yes. size but uh the original kind of records you have are about five hundred thirty thousand shang troops Plus 170,000 kind of servant slave uh, class, so 700,000 total. And on the other side, probably in around 50,000. And I think when you have, <laughs> I think we, we revised it down to something where they were a bit closer, but I think still, even, even with that big discrepancy um, in army size, History Machine, just by the sheer scale of things, got a bit thrown off. And it had that as a 50-50 battle, roughly. Um, <laughs> very, very unusual 50-50, but... Yeah. yeah, despite the big discrepancy in army sizes, it actually only gave Zhao about a 60% chance of winning. Though it did feel that the casualties dealt were way above what it was mm -hmm. expecting. It was expecting him to take 40% more casualties than he did, and it would expect him to, develop, to deal out 45% less than he ended up okay. doing so by the history machine's estimation he very much overperformed in this one but big asterisks because it's really hard oh, to know yeah, how accurate the figures we have are going into it now at least and maybe listeners just to even tell you a little bit more about it because we're kind of feeding it the information which may be consistently biased it kind of filters out and self-corrects us a small extent um now the information that's given is is probably inflated. Well, there's probably no probably about that. The information provided is inflated. Mm. How inflated is more up to the question. Could be a factor of five, could be a factor of 10. It's not as important. Now, in Chinese history, the numbers are kind of big anyway. So, you know, if if uh, if it's meant to be actually 80,000 troops and they say it's 120,000, you're kind of like, it's still a lot of people, it's still a lot of troops. At this time, these states are so small, 
the numbers don't make sense. So it's probably definitely a wildly inflated number, but something that just extrapolates and and kind of exaggerates over time. So that's the case. But for King Wu of Zhao, he is very much remembered as like almost a mythical hero as well in his own time. He's going to be considered this very august, fantastic individual. Now, a very impressive battle. Uh, very limited information. And I will say as well, like, while we have gone on about how inflated the numbers do seem, we're talking about over, you know, over 1000 mm-hmm. BC, more than 3000 years ago. And even the modern estimates scaling down still would have each side having 50 to 70,000 units, which is colossal for almost any period of history. I'll go a little bit later into the reason China has a larger population. But just as a cool side note, after this battle, King Wu of Zhao celebrates with a customary royal hunt. So this is what was recorded, the spoils of said hunt. So imagine he and his buddies are going to go out, you know, it's going to be a fair few of them, and they're going to go hunting through the, the jungles and the forests, and they catch themselves 22 tigers, 2 panthers, 5,235 stags, 12 rhinoceroses, 721 yaks, 151 bears, 118 yellow bears. I'm not even sure what that's meant to be. It's just meant to be different. 353 wild boars. 18 badgers. 16 king stags. 50 musk deer. 30 tailed deer. And 3,508 other miscellaneous animals. (laughs) So at this time, the Zhao are meant to conquer 99 countries and incorporate like a hundred or so or wipe out, you know, these little microstates. Now, in this conquering that follows uh, their big win, they take 177,779 ears from the dead and they capture a further 310,230 POWs. So that's the report that this is how many, we killed this many people, cut off the ear, counted it, and then we captured this many POWs as well. I'm trying to figure out if they used a different numeric system that had different rounding or if they really went for the strategy of these numbers seem more plausible if we're very yeah, specific. Yeah, yeah, actually it looks that it's way. It's not 180,000, it's 177,779 ears. One guy got away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We could have had around 80 there at the end. <laughs> Maybe one guy was already missing his ear. Oh, uh, that could have worked, yeah. Or, or both ears. They're sure they've taken one, but... <laughs> But it's it's such a yeah it's such a strange one, um, but after they conquer or absorb the other ninety nine countries, a reported six hundred and fifty two other countries submit to the Zhao rule. So, King Wu of Zhao is culturally remembered as this really august sage ruler. The successful overthrow of the Shang is attributed to the Mandate of Heaven. This Mandate of Heaven and the King's rule by virtue is deemed a critical reason. For the cause, the continuation of, and the collapse of dynasties and rulers up until the 20th century. It's this thing of like, we've lost the approval of the cosmos, or we still have the approval of the cosmos. We can continue. So very conveniently, you'll often have a situation where we have lost the mandate of heaven. Therefore, this new tribe of whoever, or these people come over in the hills that are conquering this territory, um, they did it because they got the mandate of heaven. It's it's very similar to the Greek and Roman idea of like luck as a concept that you can have luck as a as a as a value that you have, and you either have fortune or you don't have it. They had this idea that you have this cosmos approval of the mandate of heaven, or you don't. With that, anyway, the Zhao ruled effectively for about four hundred years. Now. I did mention that we're going to explain a little bit about China's population. So China does have an unusually large population for its size in the ancient world. Now, this is attributed to a few things. The first is absolutely excellent farming techniques. The importance that has been stressed so far already of their mythical group, you know, their mythical rulers of like, he's a great engineer or he's a really, really good person at like making sure the river is going to flood correctly. Their mythical heroes aren't like super super you know super amazing ultra warriors like they can be that as well but the why they're celebrated is like they're really good at you know agriculture that's that's the important part now these excellent farming techniques they've great use of good agricultural technologies and they have extremely skilled farmers keep in mind 
the Chinese had a relatively low number of slaves in their population compared to some of the other parts in the world. Now, the reason for this is in order for you to successfully cultivate rice very effectively, you need educated or skilled, well, it's educated in the sense of they're, they're able to do this, but educated, skilled, free men working on small plots of land to be very effective because rice cultivation requires like teamwork. It just requires that coordination and that extra amount of care and skill to do it effectively. Because of these really effective techniques, you get a little, you get the population boom, that smaller amounts of land are produce more food, which means you can get more people. By about 600 BC, the Zhao are in decline. This sparks the Warring States period and a golden age of philosophical thought and political theory. And they're known in Chinese history, this, this little kind of the intellectual bubble as the hundred schools of thought. So around the year 500 BC, this is like the axial age. Uh, this is globally the axial age of thought and reason. So this appears globally and no one's 100 percent sure why it might be the case. Could be there's, you know, maybe it's because all of these have developed as agricultural societies and they have a, a surplus. Maybe it's amount of trade and trade of information and logic and reason. But for example, around the year 500 BC, you're going to get the Buddha appear in Asia. You're going to get uh, Heraclitus and Pythagoras and Anagoras appear in Ionian Greece, and you're going to have the hundred schools of thought, which is like the Taoists, the Confucians, etc., in China. So it's just going to be this almost revolution of thought and philosophy. It's going to be almost impossible to talk about China without mentioning Master Kong, who's also known as Confucius. So even today, Master Kong is one of the biggest philosophical and kind of religious figures in history. He defines a huge chunk of what it actually is to be Chinese in terms of philosophy. He further defines the mandate of heaven, and his definition extrapolates a little bit further to say that a king who is selfish, slothful, or rules as a tyrant, and neglects his people, or neglects the religious duties that he's meant to have, will lose the mandate of heaven, and that person will be overthrown with a combination of just like earthly powers and divine powers. Now, I'm in fairness, I'm probably going to upset a lot of Confucian scholars and people who have much more expertise on Master Kong and Confucius by even simplifying and watering down all of these philosophies. But I just want to give an idea of what he is. He's a book called The Analects, and it's important because it's just about as popular as the Bible or the Quran. You can pick up a copy in any bookshop. It's it's everywhere. And it's 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 like a list of, you know, various phrases and and meanings and learnings and lessons and, you know, and, and things that can be referenced. So it's it's a huge, important philosophical and religious book. Master Kong came from an area known as Khufu, and he still has descendants there to this very day bearing his surname. So Master Kong's father was a warrior or a soldier, and Master Kong was known to have loved to fish. He's very often, like there, there are no surviving, you know, like, well, obviously no photographs or anything, but there's not any very accurate depictions of him or carvings. So he's often depicted as just a smiling or laughing old man. He remained poor for virtually all of his life. He never rose above like a low middle rank official position. And in approximately 474 BC, he was ousted by a royal court. And there he went about wandering and teaching and learning from place to place and getting into little adventures, avoiding bandits, uh, you know, uh, kind of living a life in a mixture of kind of the wilderness and going from place to place. So in a, and I'm going to say this again, in a grossly oversimplified summary of his works. He preached unity. He preached a strong family unit and a hierarchy within the family. Children are very loyal to the parents. And then similarly, parents and people are loyal to the state. So he was very much a monarchist at heart. And he stressed the importance of a single, just, virtuous ruler who would have the mandate of heaven and simply by being there is going to cascade all this virtue and merit down to everyone else underneath him with kind of good intentions and great rule. He was all about having a very strong head of state. He also believed very much that human nature was good. Good is going to prevail. It's all about that humanity is good as a whole and that you should believe in, you know, the nature of men and not necessarily the laws of men. So he also believed that it was the duty of intellectuals to oppose uh, unjust or unchecked power. I think you can almost see that it's longevity because it's such a stable ideology. Yes. If you're a ruler, you want people to believe it because a lot of it is saying 
keep in your place, do your best job mm. in your in the position you have. Yes. But then if you're maybe lower down the rank, it also does have these things about, but also check the ruler in power. The ruler in power won't last if they're not just. So it seems to have a balance that everyone can take something yeah, from. Yeah, I think you're but right. But I think it does. I mean, a million reasons. But you see, in like, in, in China, you just have these very, very long, relatively stable... Mm-hmm dynasties that you don't seem to get elsewhere and i feel like this is probably a contributing factor is just this ideology kind of persisting yeah and we do have to remember carl this is one of the hundred schools of thought so there's 99 probably other contradicting you know political theories (laughs) involved and we'll get to at least one more but uh but looking at like uh, master kong or confucius i'm going to call him master kong it's kind of better just as, as the name confucius is his latinized name but master kong so his proposed solution for the warring states period that he was in was the reintroduction of a great ruler and the best ruler of all is the Zhao. This doesn't really go down well because the Zhao, whatever is left of them, are a small shell of themselves. They don't have a hegemony. They're not as popular because states became independent and they're not mediocre. And I've thought a bit about this and I really think about it. And it's like the modern equivalent if right now, Somebody was like, you know what? Europe's in a bit of turmoil. You know what we should do? Bring back the Kaiser. I think Germany really needs a Kaiser right now. And they go, I don't even know if those relatives are still alive. (laughs) Because, yeah, but remember what it was like in Germany in 1870? (laughs) I think there's at least one Habsburg left and he's on Twitter and has... He has some takes. <laughs> I haven't looked into it. I'm a bit afraid, yeah. but I've heard <laughs> there's be, a Habsburg remaining and he has takes. That might be a good one to go on to. Twitter. I, think, I think Confucius would be all about like getting that Habsburg back in power. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but that's the idea. that he, he liked this idea of like, it should return to this situation where the Zhao have uh, a single great ruler again and everything goes back to normal. That and solve all this little squabbling between these now states. So there's a famous Confucian phrase that kind of ties all that together and translated to English, it's roughly follow the Duke of Zhao. And that's meant to be this kind of mantra of just, just do your best and act good. That's what you got to do. Because the Zhao's name is always going to carry some kind of currency, kind of like the same way that Rome does in Europe, where later you'll have, you know, like the Holy Roman Empire, because like, oh, Rome's a great thing and it's really great and we'll borrow all these titles. The Zhao will be borrowed later in Chinese dynasties. For example, there's going to be like the later Zhao in the year um, 950 AD and the great Zhao in around 1350. It, it always has this certain amount of great greatness still associated with it, even though if now in the Warring States period, mm. there's still this like relatively mediocre group. A bit like a lot of words for king in European languages deriving from Caesar or the word August, yeah. kind of, you know, from Augustus, so on. Yeah, it definitely has a follow of it. So we're just about in the Warring States period. And I want to kind of go through setting up the stage of who's there, what's going on, and who's involved, who are the players, and where we're going to go with it. So the Warring States period, around um, around the year 2000 BC, there were hundreds of thousands of microstates. By about 600 BC, there's about 100 states. It's almost natural. They're all slowly absorbing the territories around them and, and getting a little bit bigger. By 400 BC, there's only seven left. There's the Zhao, the Qin. The Wei, the Han, the Chu, the Yan, and the Qi. So in this Warring States period, a very, very important text is produced, The Art of War. Now, it's a famous book. You can buy it today. It's, it's, you can get a PDF online if you want. It's definitely in the public domain. So, um, so The Art of War was written as kind of a manual and a guide for rulers and generals on how to conduct a successful campaign. And it thoroughly stresses the importance, strategically, of not going to war unless you have to, keeping a war clean and short, being prepared and calculated for warfare, knowing your terrain and how to use it or how not to use it, knowing your enemy's abilities, knowing your own limits, using surprise and deceit to try and win battles and wars, and keeping political and military objectives separate. And it's very much intended as a kind of crash course for nobles on how not to do something so incredibly stupid that it's going to end your state. So it's a wonderful piece of text and you'll read it and you'll get almost this enlightened idea of like, this is great. This is all really, you know, 
like practical information that a lot of it still applies for today because it is so high level. It's not like focused on the tiny detail of this, is what you should do with your chariot and this, is what you should do with your swordsman. It doesn't go into that detail. And also just while we're on the topic of the art of war, we have a single battle in the database in which Sun Tzu was a commander. Yay! <laughs> um, it's not, you know, it's one data point. We don't have much, but by all accounts, he did a solid job. It was a uh, 70% win over expectation battle, so it only gave him about a 30% chance to win, and they pulled it out. Well done. Uh, they took 37% fewer casualties than expected and dealt out 58% more casualties than expected. So, very the battle of Baiju. Yeah, good job, Sun Tzu. We have no very little other information about you, or if you even really commanded existed. anything else. But on that on that one battle yeah. that you're listed, yeah. you did a good yeah. job. I'm going to make another tiny note on the art of war, which is very fun because it does deal it does do a lot of dealing with spies and you know it adds extra things. It's possible that it's updated over time as it was written, and that it's probably an amalgamation of a lot of warfare and theories put together in one book, and also. I know to burst the tiny bubble of the Sun Tzu a little bit, he might have been like a mixture of several people put together. But, you know, in the sense of like, actually, it's kind of he's got characteristics of all these people and it's kind of a handy thing to go. Oh, Sun Tzu said this. And you're like, oh, OK, great. But it's, but he will have relatives or people who claim to be his relatives later that will show up in the database, which is great. But he's a fantastic he's a fantastic individual. He's really important to mention. And it really explains the art of war and the warfare that would have been would have been the manual of what to do in China at this time. So another important text, which is kind of written as the Warring States goes on, are the 36 stratagems. I'm just going to make a small note, and I discovered a lot of this the hard way. In China and in Chinese, some phrases, kind of like in English, we might say a couple literally means two, but it can also mean like a handful or a few or something. There's no exact one. 36 can mean a lot or a number of some kind but in this case there are actually 36 strategies <laughs> but it's just something to mention i'm also going to mention now because there will be pedants probably listening in irish english especially a couple means a few yeah in irish cupla means a few it doesn't mean two yes exactly i'm just going to clear that up now it's it's established the hiberno english <laughs> it's it's what we speak yes it is before you say no a couple is definitely two i'm going to get that out of the way and now back to the it the actual point yeah, of the podcast. Yeah, that's a fair point. <laughs> so yes, a dozen is 12, a baker's dozen is 13, and so on. But a, yeah, couple, cupola, there's there's a Hiberno-English overlap. Um, but 36 can sometimes mean a number or a vague number. And in this case, there actually are 36, but it's just something to note because there probably were ones added over time because they're, they're examples that are given. But anyway, these 36 stratagems are examples of do's and don'ts in military and political situations. So... I'm going to give you a couple examples and their rough translations and kind of what they're what they might mean. So one of the 36 stratagems is to kill with a borrowed knife. And what that generally is, as an example, is convince somebody else or some state to give you their resources or their military to strike a target you want to deal with. So it's kind of like in modern business, somebody goes like, oh, don't spend your own money. Spend the bank's money. Don't do something so silly like that, that you're going to be bankrupt. So in the same way in Chinese states, they're like, borrow someone else's army and use them. And if their <laughs> army gets obliterated, well, then they're down an army and you are still fine. Another one of the stratagems is to loot a burning house. So if a state is in a chaotic state, that's probably a good one for you to go and pillage. <laughs> Another one of the stratagems is to watch the fires burning across the river. So that's wait for an opposing army to exhaust themselves and then commit for the win. And that will be to a way to maximize your gains and minimize your losses. So all of these are very kind of businessy, strategic. It's very fun for, yeah. for going through them. This, and again, they're high, they're, yeah. you know, similar to Sun Tzu, they're high level enough that they will work for you when playing, you know, Crusader Kings yes. or, you know, Total War or any yeah. number of other strategy games. They, they apply in all situations. Yeah. This might be my favorite one. Take the opportunity to pilfer a goat. <laughs> <laughs> so if you find yourself that opportunity arises that didn't exist, wasn't part of the plan, be willing to jump on it. <laughs> And I, so I love the idea where it's like, I went out there and then we realized we can steal this goat. So we did. <laughs> the goat wasn't part of the plan, but now we have milk and meat. Um, this is one 
that is another one of these stratagems that applies so heavily to the Macedonians that we covered earlier. Defeat the enemy by capturing their chief. Kill or capture the commander. <laughs> so it's kind of like, yeah, sometimes when all else fails, just kill their king. And that might work. That might do it. And another one, befriend a distant state to attack a neighbor. So you should make your allies as far away as possible in, and make it difficult for them to attack you or you to attack them so that we can leave each other alone so you can focus your military might on an enemy closer to home where your supplies and your gains are going to be a lot easier and you won't have to worry about uh, a distant neighbor either providing them support or giving them any kind of, you know, any kind of maybe troops or means or money. And... Another very, very, very practical one that a lot of people tend to kind of ignore, particularly in the in an idea of even, you know, armchair generals, if all else fails, just retreat. It's not, you know, it's not a surrender. It's not a loss. Live to fight another day. Just do that. Um, now, these are very fun strategies and tactics between the 36 stratagems and the art of war. They only work or seem to work really effectively if you're the only person doing it. So imagine it's if war, you know, you know, war is the war and deceit is the big take home message from the art of war. where you are trying to trick your enemy all the time and make sure that you appear strong when you're actually weak and you appear weak when you're strong and you make the, you know, you fool the enemy constantly. But if this is a giant nonstop mind game, it's like I'm trying to trick you. You're trying to trick me. I'm going to set some fires to pretend I'm here. I'm going to move my army over there. It's it's this chaotic situation where these work wonderfully if you're fighting a bunch of barbarians who don't know anything, but if you're fighting somebody else who's practicing this same chaotic back and forth, you just got a massive amount of deceit, creating this feedback loop of indecision, and you're relying really heavily on luck and intelligence. And that's why I play those previous strategy games in single player, because multiplayer, that's what it does become, and I am not good enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So still, all that said, I'm not going to exactly, you know, throw these out, you know, <laughs> like these manuals. They're fantastic. So they're great examples for learning on how warfare was developed and how it was fought and how it should be fought at China in this time. So the militaries at the time for the warring state period, they go up and down in numbers, in population, in ability, in tech. For example, the Qin are going to go up quite a bit in terms of numbers. Now, all of these numbers are likely inflated and up to a factor of 10, but I'm going to do a breakdown of the various armies involved what they're known for, what kind of their, their setup, their bits and pieces, and what they were reportedly supposed to have to field for an army. So the Zhao, who are located in the north of China, they are known extensively for their use of horse archers because they were the first to adopt them in approximately 306 BC. They trained a lot for warfare and they had low military wages and were deemed a very gentle and soft-hearted people. Even though they trained a lot for warfare, that didn't really reflect on their performance. They did have the horse archers, but that was a lot of that was organically because of contact with um, nomad tribes who would have had horse archers as well. The Zhao in the north, they were known not to fight to the death, and their behavior was deemed quite poor and disorderly if they had to retreat. They were meant to have 750,000 infantry, 10,000 light cavalry, and 1,000 chariots. Numbers seem huge. As again, we'll just go through, this is what was meant to be the kind of figures that these, you know, kingdoms and states could put into the field if need be. Once again, could be inflated, but if they're all inflated, at least we've kind of got a, a reasonable, you know, estimation of like and like apples with apples, oranges with oranges. Now, probably the most important group here we're going to talk about is the next kingdom, and they're the Qin, and they're where China gets their name from. They are located in the West. They have a ferocious reputation. They are viewed by the other states as these backward barbarians, almost in the same way that the Greeks viewed the Macedonians. They're deemed a very brave people with excellent morale. They have been poor for most of their history, but eventually, after adopting political reformations, they strengthen their state. A cool aspect of them is they're known to actually discard their armor in order to chase fleeing enemies. So if they're routing the enemy and chasing them down, they're like, I'm, I'm, I've got a lot of good equipment here, but I can't quite run after them. I'm going to throw off my armor. I'm going to run them down. As a people, they were hardened by decades of conflict and completely draconian inter- internal policies. They were reported at their height to have as many as a million infantry, 
a thousand chariots and ten thousand light cavalry. So, by far, they're going to be like the most important, um, the most important kingdom we're going to talk about. We're going to come back to them. The Chu in the south, they were known for having very large formations of men. They're similarly to the Zhao, considered a soft people by their various neighbors. But what's cool about them is they are very early adopters of new technology, but also they're very slow to discard other technologies. So, for example, they were known to have shark skin and rhino hide armor. And that that would have been armor that would have existed in other states. But they're like, no, we moved on to, you know, to various leathers and to, to iron, plate, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but these guys are still using it. So imagine um, they have the latest tech and the oldest tech simultaneously running. They are meant to be, which is uh, probably attributed to them, there's no reason not to suggest it, to have been the people who invented the repeating crossbow. And they had excellent crossbowmen. So the repeating crossbow is, and I'll get into it a little bit better, it's a very low power crossbow that has a pistol grip. You can pull it back and you can fire, pull it back and fire. So it has a magazine on the top so you can repeatedly pull back. And it's meant to be, the, it's, it's the closest thing you're going to get to, you know, a pistol in the ancient world. They were meant to have a million infantry, a thousand chariots as well, and about 10,000 light cavalry. Now, the next kingdom, which is important, are the Wei. They are right in the middle of the warring states in the, in the country. They're surrounded. They have a border with just about everybody else. They were known to have absolutely excellent heavy spears and hal or kind of halberds, kind of like close to pikes. They had brilliant heavy cavalry and they mixed their units and they were well equipped with their armor and their weapons. They were meant to have 300,000 regular infantry, 200,000 heavy phalanx-like spearmen, 600 chariots, and about 5,000 light cavalry. Next along our list are the Han. The Han are also near the center of China. They're just below the Wei. They're considered very similar to the Zhao in that they also trained a lot for warfare, but they also had like low military wages. They were deemed still like a gentle, soft people. Their training didn't reflect on their performance as well. They, they wouldn't fight to the death. They were disordered as well during retreats. But what they had going for them was they were early adopters of iron and steel weapons and they used protective face masks and they were known to make by far the best weapons of any of the states. So you want a very good spear, you get it from Han. They had 290,000 infantry, about 5,000 light cavalry and 500 chariots. The next kingdom are the Qi. They are in the east and they actually touch and border with the sea. They had a reputation for really poor organization. They had really aloof, arrogant officials and nobles. They had very rich, productive lands that produced some good soldiers. So the Qi were known to have an excellent elite number of small, heavy hitter troops in their army who were well drilled, well equipped and like excellent, excellent fighters. Now, the problem with this is these troops were used almost always in the front of the army or where the typical enemy engagement occurred. So they're like the tip of the spear. So this made for an army with an absolutely excellent vanguard, but ultimately they had a soft, like underperforming main body. So they had the hard hitting super troops. But if you got past that, almost like, you know, punching through um, an exoskeleton, you're going to hit this soft center. So if you could deal with their elite troops, you could deal with them. They were meant to have 240,000 infantry, 500 chariots, and 4,000 light cavalry. Now, the last kingdom we're going to talk about is the Yan. They also touched the sea, so they're in the east of China. They were known as excellent defenders, but they were often inflexible for their positions and their formations. So they were also early adapters of steel weapons, and they had a reputation as really good-natured, polite, pleasant people. And a cool little fact about them is that they used knife money. So what I mean by knife money is they're little bits of knife shaped and sized metal that would have been used as a currency instead of coins. Kind of looks cool. And they had 200,000 infantry, 500 chariots and 5,000 cavalry. I know I keep saying it, but the scale is ridiculous where now we get to the end and I'm like, ugh, only 200,000 infantry. <laughs> Something that would have just <laughs> yeah. destroyed anything else in the world at the time. But. I, I, I think that's what the Persians brought to Thermopylae, you know, like in a similar, yeah. maybe more realistic number. It's like, oh, 200,000. Yeah, it's pathetic. Yeah. What are you going to have? 200 groups of 1,000 guys together? Is that it? <laughs> so uh, ultimately, just to go through a little bit, the armor and the weapons differed from kingdom to kingdom. They included a mixture of bronze and steel tip weapons, 
you know, you'd, ha you'd have leather, fur, hides, shark skin, as we mentioned. You'd have lacquered armor. You'd have bronze and steel armor. And uh, you'd have, like, anything. Even some of them were made of, like, wicker and straw. So it's the range is huge in terms of what, what people have. The main weapon at this time used by your standard, you know, infantry is a halberd weapon with a spear point and an axe-like blade that points out at about 90 degrees from the main blade. So you can imagine you've got a long pole, at the very end you have a spear at the top, and then at a 90 degree angle to the spear, there's another blade jutting out. Now, what's that for? Is uh, That blade is literally, you can stab forward, and usually it's it's used to try to attack cavalry or pull a guy off a horse. So it's pretty cool. It's, it's kind of got a, a hook-like feature to it. I feel like these were common in Europe, but like a thousand years later. A little bit. Like it, it, it didn't seem to take on this side of the world as early. To defend the, the Macedonians a little bit about that, um, a cool thing about, you know, obviously the law of the lever, the Macedonians had a very small point at the top of their, you know, huge pikes. And the idea is the spear is so long, literally you have to hold it up. You're like, there's going to be the more weight on the end, the harder it is to hold and to angle it. But in this case, it, it seems that the benefits definitely outweighed it for the Chinese here, that they probably had shorter and halberd weapons, but it definitely had kind of an elaborate shape to it that was multifunctional for warfare. Swords and shields are really common, so you'll find infantry with both. Um, chariots are still in vogue. We mentioned we had a whole little section at the start talking a little bit more about chariots. They're mostly this time used by the officer classes or nobles, and they're often used as some kind of mobile command platform to quickly get the general from A to B to see what's going on. Cavalry differed heavily region from region. Um, contact with nomadic tribes very often resulted in getting horse archers or even mercenaries of horse archers as a branch of your light cavalry. And as time developed, this makes a lot of sense. Horse breeds get better, horses get bigger. You don't have to rely as much on the chariot. And then suddenly the horse can carry heavier things and heavier people and you know heavier payloads and you'll eventually get the likes of close to heavy cavalry as well. Some states then often had heavier cavalry than others. Crossbows. This has to be one of the biggest defining features of the infantry in Chinese warfare and particularly for the Warring State period. Now, crossbows were the norm. They were made absolutely superbly with manufactured bronze triggers that provided firepower with very little training. Now, I'm going to make a, a comparison just to kind of show you how flexible this is that you might say, oh, maybe they have a million infantry and they kind of go, yeah, but these guys aren't really trained or that, whatever. So just to give you the example, if we pick some point in the Middle Ages, it's reported, and this would be for an archer in England or, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a long woman, they would start training to use a bow around the age of eight. And it would take 10 years of training for you to be effective at using that bow. You know, you need the time to build up the muscles, you need the time to literally warp your skeleton and change your overall frame that you can pull back the bow and fire. So it would take 10 years of training. So you'd start at eight, you're ready to go at 18. And then and only then could you be an effective person who could fire an arrow at the distance you need to fire it with the power and the strength that it needs. You know, you need to pull back the bow to give it the effective velocity so that it hits troops that you want it to hit so you can aim it in the right direction. All of this, and I mean all of this, can be bypassed by having a very well manufactured crossbow and getting a crossbowman and that person could be effectively trained over a period if needed of a few days or maybe a month and that is a game changer so if you imagine you've got a nice unit of archers that took 10 years to train they're 18 years of age going to take another decade to replace them if you lose them and they get run down by some heavy cavalry you have lost them you've lost your wonderful missile troops but if this happened in the warring states period you've got your crossbowmen set up the heavy cavalry comes in it wipes them out you go give me a month yeah and it's the same reason that like you know a thousand years later gunpowder would take over quite quickly because again like that was very slow to, you know early mm. guns weren't good they were slow to reload they weren't that powerful yeah probably contemporary crossbows were as strong as them but you can train people so much faster on them than you can to fire a bow and arrow. Definitely. And very important thing to mention is the draw strength of a Warring States crossbow varies. Now, the reported varying is different, but generally the, the common consensus is it's a very low poundage. 
especially if it's a repeating crossbow, because you're meant to be able to hold the pistol section of it, the pistol grip section with one hand, pull back with the other. So that's a single hand kind of pull back and then fire and repeat the process. So that's meant to be something as, as low as like a 30 kg draw. You know, it's very, very, very low, which 30 kg is like 60 pounds, just to give an equivalent or, or, uh, or a comparison. They could have had very, very low draw strength. Now, they have better ones. Some some crossbows are meant to be pulled back. This all varies. Some are meant to be pulled back with like holding your, you know, getting your legs sitting down in a cross position, um, grabbing, you know, grabbing the center, pulling it back as hard as you can. And that obviously would have a way better draw strength. But if we want to compare the Warring States crossbow with the medieval European crossbow, it's chalk and cheese, it's apples and oranges. It's not the same. Now, medieval crossbows, and this is funny just to, this is fun just to even kind of look at and study and examine. A medieval crossbow often uses this kind of wrencher mechanism. It's like you don't have enough power in your body to pull this thing back. You literally have to use a mechanism to do it. And crossbows in the medieval age, particularly in Europe, had an arms race with armor. As armor got better, as the steel plates got better, as the joints got better, as the blacksmiths were able to make better and better and better iron armor with, you know, finer patterns, better angles, more protection, thicker, you know, thicker plate. The arms race existed that the crossbow just got heavier and heavier. The bolt got better. The poundage got bigger. And if you want to compare like the crossbow of the late medieval ages that's going to fire this super heavy bolt that's going to punch through plate steel and then... The Warring States Chinese equivalent is going to be this much lower poundage weapon that could probably fire at a faster rate, doesn't require you to have like a wrench or a mechanism to pull it back, and it only needs to possibly punch through potentially straw or leather or shark skin. It's not, you know, it's going to be a lot easier. So we don't have to worry too much about, um, we don't have to worry too much about like the overall penetrating power of it. What you do have to worry about is that uh, maybe the rate of fire is more important. So repeating crossbows that do like, you know, bring back the string, load the bolt and fire the shot from a single drawback motion. They're invented, they're used. They have a, a magazine that's placed on the top. So in that way, you actually don't have an, an aimable sight on the repeating ones you might have on a regular crossbow, but it does mean that you can, you know, repeatedly fire a lot of shots. I think it's it works out as, you know, you're not exactly quite aiming here. You're just trying to get as many shots as possible, but you could shoot up to, one person could shoot up to 30 shots a minute if they utilize this really effectively. So it's a, it's a lot about rate of fire. And it makes sense, especially if they're fighting a lot of nomads in the north who are horseback archers. You just want to put as many projectiles in the air as possible. Yeah, we were talking about the army composition. And I think when you see armies that size, you can kind of assume two things. One, you want to be able to train people very quickly, just to the you know high turnover. And two, with that many people, a very low percentage are going to be the ones who can afford good armor. So having speed, both of training and speed of the weapon, is definitely preferable to power. It makes a huge difference. It just means you can you can get an army in the field really, really relatively quickly and not have to worry too much about... Now, you still have to train them and drill them. And if you train and drill them, it's all the better. But you just have an effective number. It's not just a, it's not just a big blob of men that can't really do anything. You have given them the means to do damage with a limited amount of training. Anyway, the crossbow, it just has to be mentioned, it's super popular. It was used by just about everybody. As we said, uh, some people would have them on chariots. Uh, some people would have it on regular light cavalry as well. It was just really effective, ridiculously well manufactured for the time. There's like beautiful bronze triggers and they're made to this wonderful, um, wonderful specification and standard that like if they were, I think it's like if they were a millimeter thicker, they wouldn't work or thinner. You know, it's 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 a really well, very well, like the, there has to be a lot of credit given to the the actual, the smiths that make these things, because they're making thousands of them. The crossbow is is really one of the defining weapons used at this time, and it's used by just about everybody. We've covered a lot for this episode, and in fairness, almost all of this is just setting up where this is, what it looks like, what an army looks like, naming some of the kingdoms, giving you a background of what's involved. But because this was such just an information dump of an episode, we're going to talk about from the Warring State period, just to give you an idea of what's going on, um, how these battles were kind of fought, who was involved, and you know what what the outcomes typically were. And this will give you kind of a general idea because the next episode is going to be just battle heavy. It's just going to be a very very heavy. Then these guys fought these guys. These guys fought these guys. These guys won. You know, it's it's going to be a huge trade of 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 battles and information and generals and names. And if we just jumped headfirst into that. There would have been so 
it would have been so confusing. Um, it would have been almost impossible to follow. So I think this foundation is thoroughly needed for this part of the episode. The battle we're going to do is the uh, battle approximately around the year 354 BC or so, the Battle of Gurling. The Kingdom of Wei were going to siege the Zhao city of Han Dan. Now the Zhao, in response to being sieged by the Kingdom of Wei, they turn to the Qi for help. This leads a little bit like uh, the whole borrowing a knife situation of the 36 stratagems. So generals Qian Ji and Sun Bin, who's supposedly the grandson of Sun Tzu, they're going to, now remember, they're fighting for uh, the Zhao. They're going to borrow a Qi army to save the Zhao. Now Sun Bin opens this up by feinting an attack south with a distraction force. Here's our deceit. Here's our, I want to tell you I'm over here. He's going to feint with an attack in the south. Pang Wan, the Wei general, he falls for this disinformation and then he proceeds to double down on his siege efforts. He's like, it's time to, we're going to ramp up this siege. Sun Bin then decides to actually move a huge attacking force to the Wei capital of Dai Liang. Now, Pang Wan, upon knowing or finding out that Sun Bin has now moved a huge attacking force to take the Wei capital, he takes his best cavalry and he heads to defend it. Along the route to defend the capital, is then surprised and ambushed by Sun Bin, who then Pan Yang narrowly escapes with his life. So there's a huge amount of just, you know, feints, counterfeits, deceits, ambushes, um, like counterattacks. So this whole battle leads to a proverb to besiege Wei to rescue Zhao. And it is one of the 36 stratagems. So Kahal, considering there's a big sequence of events here, let's go into what the history machine thinks are the results of uh, Sun Bin, who is fighting using another state's army, uh, using the Qi army to defend the Zhao, while, you know, while the kingdom of Wei ends up trying to <laughs> besiege the Zhao, but losing with their own capital is attacked. So it's, it's such a, it's, it's a lot of arrows going in a lot of directions at the same time. Yeah, it's, it's funny because at, at first glance, when I looked over this battle, the army sizes on both sides are pretty much you know it's symmetrical yes. armies nearly like they're very very similar size and similar composition but then yeah we do have in the history machine machine modifiers for if it's a siege and if it's an ambush and this was both which i don't know if there <laughs> are any other examples of that given the weird mix of modifiers the history machine battles settled on giving the chi and Zhao about a 40 percent chance to win so they exceeded that it was uh 0.589 win over expectation. Okay. Uh, they dealt out 21% more casualties than expected and took about 10% fewer. So it was an elaborate way to get there, but all in all, the history machine felt that they did a good job. Good. <laughs> after, sorry, after that very complicated sequence of events, yeah. which similar ones will repeat over time here now. <laughs> like, we kind of have like, that ah, was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> the, yeah, the history machine does not take into account all those elaborate steps, yeah. but it definitely it it risks getting thrown when you have those unusual combinations that it probably just doesn't have a very big sample size of, um, where it's it's strange permutation. But um, yeah, it, it considers this one to be a solid uh, solid win against the odds, not dramatically against the odds, but still like an underdog yeah. victory. It's very unusual, but that that's that seems to be it now. Um... I know uh, we kind of only glanced a little bit at it with the history machine dealing with all these very unusual battles with these unusual numbers and different sequence of events and follow up through. But, uh, Kyle, is there any kind of noticeable difference between the warfare that's happening in this part of the world and the warfare that we've been focusing mostly localized in the Mediterranean and the and the, you know, West Asia in comparison? Yeah, well, I think the scale is obviously the first thing, as we've said several times already, but it is just these are army sizes that... It's not just where you'd say, oh, you wouldn't see this in, you know, Europe until so many, you know, centuries later. It's literally, you just rarely see it at all anywhere in history. Um, I think the other thing to note, and it's, I, I suppose, a combination of that and probably also, I suppose, we're dealing a culture that did record things maybe better than certain other, you know, cultures we've covered or tried to cover or will try to cover. Um, a lot of named commanders in each battle. Yes. 
Um, again, some of this, like we were saying with Sun Tzu, some of those might be added after the fact because they want to up the, the prestige of the win oh, and things yeah, like definitely. that. But um, we have a very large number of generals, but very few generals who have a large number of battles. Mm -hmm. um, we are still kind of only scraping the surface of this episode, so we, I think... You know, I, I think up to this point in history, in the database, there are only one or two that even have two battles listed. Um, but you know. as I said, we're going to have a next part episode. So this one is just on yes. early China. The next episode, we will go much more in depth into the Warring State period and focus on what was actually happening in that situation, and we'll have a lot more involved. This is going to be a multi-part episode. Um, I think you know it's probably going to take four to five episodes to thoroughly complete what we just want to cover um, because there's so much involved um, but ultimately I think the goal of this is to introduce what we got just set the scene have it have it ready to go and then move on to the warring state period and then the rise of the Qin the Qin empire and finally the decline of the Qin so there is a lot all together in this to involve so we're nearly finished before we do we want to include another battle from the Warring States period, just to set it up. Now, funnily enough, this is going to be a battle with the same commanders. It's going to be like, you know, you're, you're, we, we had our, you know, we had our fight, and then we're going to have like, uh, we're going to have Pang Yang versus uh, Sun Bin Two, <laughs> Electric Boogaloo, and see who, like, who got it right, who got it wrong. You know, maybe he got lucky last time. We're going to try it again. This is going to be it. So this is around 342 BC, the Battle of Mai Ling, and. It's going to be another example that we'll we'll just do before we finish out this episode to give you some idea of what's going on, how warfare is fought at this time, and what the commanders are kind of like. So, in this battle, Pang Huan, who's the same general from the last who's fighting for the Kingdom of Wei, he is incredibly cautious because of his previous defeat at Gerling. So he orders his troops to move around any chi troops he finds to avoid any potential ambushes and scout the area ahead, because he does not want to be caught in the same trap twice. Pang Wan is in an advantageous position. So he decides, even though he's cautious, he's going to rush for a cavity. Sun Bin decides not to engage his enemy on the move. Instead, Sun Bin is going to rest his troops. Now, with Sun Bin and his rested troops, and the Wei troops who are trying to cautiously but rapidly approach, his are... Uh, well rested, the Wei troops are a little bit tired. Sun Bin has his troops light 100,000 campfires for the very first night. Then for night two, he has them light only 50,000 campfires. And then finally for night three, he has them light 20,000 campfires. Now what this would imply, and it's the real deceit and trickery, it gives Pang Wan the impression that the Qi army must have a low morale and they are hemorrhaging troops to desertion. So to double down on this potential disinformation he's going to get here, Sun Bin has his army abandon some siege equipment to make it look like they didn't even have time to get this and, you know, nobody packed this up and went. They flee for their lives. By all means, it looks like this big army is just losing troops all the time and you know, please come and attack it. Like, you have the opportunity. Pill for the goat. Do what you need to do. So Sun Bin sets up an ambush in a nearby wood. Now, with a bit of confidence, Pang Wan is a little bit more confident now of like, okay, I think I got this guy. But he doesn't. There's an ambush set in a nearby wood. He has, this is elaborate, but it works. He has a death message carved into a tree for Pang Wan. So, like, a bit of text carved in. Uh, now, Pang, Pang Wan heads to get this message and to see, what is it? Um, uh, so he heads under the cover of darkness for a little bit of safety uh, to see what this might be and to, you know, to read it himself. And his troops get caught in a crossfire of a nighttime volley. Now, Pang Wan manages to survive. This nighttime engagement alarms the Wei troops, who thought they had a numerical advantage, They've already they they've lost historically to them. They panic and they scatter, and this results with the aid, obviously, of the Qi army of a Qi victory. Pang Huan commits suicide instead of allowing himself to be captured, and then his body is mutilated by the Qi army when they finally get it. 
this is a good example of you know a, a lot of deceit a lot of a lot of you know intelligence and counterintelligence and a very effective use of of using the various stratagems and using the art of war and very kind of tactically being cautious and dangerous and and uh you know acting and reacting and and you know being active and proactive like it being you know proactive and reactive it's it's this real back and forth tit for tat mind game kind of situation but because of this battle the kingdom of way never really fully recover from this defeat and they cease to be one of the main threats for the warring state period Cahill, with this as i said elaborate setup a lot of little information included in it of like why this happened, who went there, who read a message in the forest, you know, who was caught in a volley of crossfire. Um, what does the history machine make of this sequence of events? So this one was another interesting one for it to kind of interpret because it ended up with giving it about 50-50. Uh, Tiangji did have the bigger army, but maybe the composition, it had fewer, you know, cavalry and fewer heavy troops. Um, but they did have the ambush. So 50-50 battle. So it thought it could go either way. Obviously it went their way. The really standout thing from this, though, uh, is the 89.7% <sighs> more casualties dealt than expected. Oh, well, that um, is a massacre. Which is... Total massacre. And, I mean, you have, as you said, the you know, saying how the, the whole thing went out, you just had a very rapid scattering and panic in the army. And... Always the huge casualties in any ancient battle is just disorganized retreats mm -hmm. is where the damage gets done. And this is the best example. It was a massive, massive army and almost all of them were basically killed um, or captured. So yeah, it was a... that's. I think that of all the ones we will do in the China episodes, and possibly overall, I need to double check that, yeah. but this is uh, one of the highest ever casualties dealt over expectation. So, yeah, that's our two, those are our two sample battles, just to give you a kind of a taste or a flavour for what's involved in the Warring States period, and with a bit of background on, like, how warfare is kind of fought in China at this time, and how deceitful, and, you know, using really reliant on intelligence and spies and counter-information. It's, 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 it's very excellent stuff with the tiny little random details that seem to be the, the bit of information that's, you know, attributed for why, you know, General A beats General B. All right. So we're just coming to the very end of this episode. The next episode will be on the warring states in China, and we will focus very heavily as well on the Qin, where the word China literally comes from. And obviously they're going to be the rising star of the next episode. This is going to be a first for the History Machine podcast. We are actually not for this episode going to have a top anything, simply because we have only mentioned these two generals. So we will group those people and include them in the next episode where we've got a lot more figures, a lot more information, a lot more blunders, a lot more big wins, a lot more, in, you know, a lot more battles for a proper actual counter episode. So finishing up on this one, after months and months of research, because we had such a big gap in this, we actually have a lot of episodes to release. And because we just knew nothing yeah, going into true. it. <laughs> <laughs> um, we at least had some idea of who the Romans are or like where where Greece is relative to us. <laughs> yeah. I had no idea the Kingdom of Wei was in the centre of China <laughs> but, uh, yeah. <laughs> until now. But um, yeah, because we have done such an extensive amount of research on this and we've only, I feel, touched the tip of the iceberg of what we're going to be telling you about this period in Chinese history. Um, we're going to have another episode out relatively quick. But this is very much the required reading. And for the next one, I'm going to tell people, normally we say you can listen to whatever episode you want, but this is definitely required reading for the next episode. But we are going to finish up on this, on our episode on early China. And for the next episode, we're going to focus on the Warring States period. And then there'll be even a further episode after that. Possibly another after that. We'll see how we go. Yeah, it's very true. <laughs> there is a lot to cover and all of it I think is fascinating very similar to our, our work on Augustus and, and even the earlier stuff there's so many tidbits of tiny little bit of information you're like oh that's that's a funny little thing for history to hinge on but uh, we're going to call it that one uh, we're going to leave this episode so I have been Niall and I've been Cole and thanks very much for listening mm -hmm.